So our cells can take fat and free fatty acids and oxidize them to produce ATP to fuel all the energetic processes we need for life. So this process is referred to as beta oxidation, when we oxidize fat to produce ATP. But how exactly do our cells go through beta oxidation? Well, in previous videos, we've learned that we can take glucose molecules to enter through glycolysis. And when we take glucose molecules to go through glycolysis, we produce pyruvate molecules. And then we know the pyruvate molecules can enter the mitochondria, be converted into acetyl-CoA to then enter the Krebs cycle. And in previous videos, we've learned that glycolysis and the Krebs cycle are collectively referred to as central metabolism. However, why do we take glucose molecules to go through central metabolism? Well, when we go through central metabolism, we produce these ATP molecules. And we know we need these ATP molecules to fuel all the energetic processes the cell needs for life. However, we don't only produce ATP molecules, we also produce these reduced cofactors. And we know these reduced cofactors can fuel the electron transport chain to create even more ATP. So again, when we take glucose molecules to go through central metabolism, we directly produce ATP, and we also produce these reduced cofactors that fuel the electron transport chain to create even more ATP. But now you may wonder, can we take these free fatty acids to enter central metabolism to create ATP? Well, no. If we want to take free fatty acids and use them to create ATP, we need to take these free fatty acids and we need to go through a pathway referred to as beta oxidation. But what's really important to realize is whenever we go through one round of beta oxidation, first of all, the free fatty acid gets shorter. We lose two carbons every time we go through a round of beta oxidation. For example, if we have a 16 carbon free fatty acid, if we go through one round of beta oxidation, we'll be left with a 14 carbon free fatty acid. However, what else do we produce when we go through one round of beta oxidation? Well, we also create one FADH2, one NADH2, and one acetyl-CoA molecule. And now we can see what happened to those two carbons. We lost two of those carbons in the form of these two carbons in acetyl-CoA. So what's important to realize is every time we take a free fatty acid and go through one round of beta oxidation, we create one FADH2, one NADH, and one acetyl-CoA molecule. So we can see we can take these reduced cofactors to fuel the electron transfer chain to directly create ATP. So again, these free fatty acids directly produce reduced cofactors to fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. Also, we create acetyl-CoA molecules, which can theoretically also enter through the Krebs cycle. Even though in the context of beta oxidation, usually these acetyl-CoA molecules are used for ketogenesis, but I talked about that in the video on ketogenesis. I have a link of that video below. But again, we go through a round of beta oxidation, so we lose two carbons. We go from 16 carbons to 14 carbons. So now we have this 14 carbon free fatty acid. However, we can go through another round of beta oxidation. And again, every time we go through a round of beta oxidation, we lose two carbons. We go from 14 carbons to 12 carbons. We lose two carbons. And again, we know we lost those two carbons in the form of acetyl-CoA. But we also created these reduced cofactors, which we know can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So that's the way we use free fatty acids to produce ATP. We go through rounds of beta oxidation, and every time we go through a round of beta oxidation, we create these reduced cofactors to fuel the electron transport to create ATP. But how exactly do we go through beta oxidation? What exactly are we doing to produce these reduced cofactors? So how exactly do we take free fatty acids and oxidize them through beta oxidation? Well, the first step is to take this coenzyme A compound. So once we form this coenzyme A compound, we know we have this thiol sulfur group. So the first step is to deprotonate this hydrogen from this thiol sulfur group. So when we deprotonate this hydrogen, we're left with this sulfur anion, which is very nucleophilic. So it can nucleophilically attack this electrophilic carbonyl carbon. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna nucleophilically attack this carbonyl carbon. And when we do that, we form a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond. And then these electrons fall on this oxygen. So when we do that, we're going to form this acyl-CoA. Now, once we form this acyl-CoA, now we can go through the process of beta oxidation. So again, every time we do one round of beta oxidation, we create these reduced cofactors, one acetyl-CoA molecule, and we're left 
With a new acyl-CoA, that's two carbons shorter. But what is the chemistry behind this mechanism? What exactly are we doing? So first, let's focus on these two hydrogens. Essentially what we can do is we can take this oxidized FAD cofactor, and it essentially reacts with this acyl-CoA, stealing these hydrogens and electrons. And when we do that, we create this reduced FADH2. So now we produce the reduced cofactor that can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So that's the first step where this FAD gets reduced into FADH2 and the acyl-CoA gets oxidized to have this double bond. So now we're left with this unsaturated acyl-CoA. So now what do we do? Well, essentially we react with a water molecule. We go through a simple addition where we add this water molecule to this double bond. So essentially what happens is these electrons in this double bond nucleophilically attack this hydrogen. And when they do that, this bond breaks and these electrons fall in the oxygen. So when we do that, we form this intermediate. So now we have a nucleophilic oxygen and an electrophilic carbon so they can react. We nucleophilically attack, going, completing the addition reaction. And again, keep in mind, all these mechanisms are catalyzed by enzymes, so these are simplified mechanisms, but essentially we take the double bond and we add the water to form this structure. So now we have this compound with this hydroxyl group. So now let's focus on these two hydrogens. So the next step is we take this oxidized NAD cofactor, which essentially reacts with this hydroxyl group. And essentially what happens is we go through a reaction where this oxidized NAD gets reduced into NADH, and this hydroxyl gets oxidized into this carbonyl group. So that's the next step. But notice when we go through this next reaction, so when we go through this next step, we produce this reduced NADH cofactor, which again can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So that's how we create the reduced NADH cofactor. So now we're left with this compound with these two carbonyl groups. So now the last step is we take another coenzyme A, and again, we deprotonate this hydrogen, forming this sulfur anion, which is very nucleophilic. And again, we know this carbonyl carbon is electrophilic, so we can react. Where this sulfur nucleophilically attacks this carbon, when we do that, we form a bond. And when we form a bond, we break a bond, where these electrons fall on this guy. And when we do that, we form this product. So again, realize what we did. We nucleophilically attacked forming a bond represented by this bond, this particular bond. And when we did that, then we broke this bond. And when we broke this bond, we essentially separated these two groups represented by these two groups. So now we form these two products. But notice we're done, we've done it. Now we have the acetyl-CoA compound and we form an acyl-CoA that's two carbons shorter. Now we have a 14 carbon acyl-CoA. So we've done it. Remember, we started with the 16 carbon acyl-CoA. We went through that round of beta oxidation and now we produce a 14 carbon acyl-CoA and we produced all these products. Remember, first we produced the FADH2, then we produced the NADH, then we produced the acetyl-CoA. So that's a round of beta oxidation. And again, every time we do a round of beta oxidation, we produce these products where these cofactors can fuel the electron transfer chain and this acetyl-CoA can enter into other metabolic processes. However, we're not done because now that we've produced this 14 acyl-CoA, now we can do another round of beta oxidation. So I'm gonna draw this 14 carbon acyl-CoA up here. So now that we produce this 14 carbon acyl-CoA, we can do another round of beta oxidation. So again, remember the first step is to essentially take these hydrogens and react with this oxidized FAD to produce this reduced FADH2. So now we produce the reduced FADH2, which can fuel the electron transfer chain. And we're left with this unsaturated double bond. So again, remember the next step is now to add a water molecule to form this hydroxyl group. Then we take this oxidized NAD to react to form this reduced NADH, which again can fuel the electron transfer chain. And when we do that, again, the oxidized NAD gets reduced to NADH. So when this guy gets reduced, this hydroxyl gets oxidized into a carbonyl. And now that we have a carbonyl group, we can react it with this coenzyme A, which again, we explain the mechanism, we form a bond and we break a bond. And now we're left with these products. 
So again, this represents one round of beta oxidation. Again, we started with the 14 carbon acyl CoA, and then we were left with the 12 carbon acyl CoA. So we lost two carbons in the form of acetyl CoA, which again, this is where the two carbons went. And again, whenever we do one round of beta oxidation, we create one FADH2 cofactor and one NADH cofactor, which again, we already explained how these reduced cofactors can fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. So this is the way we take free fatty acids and oxidize them to produce ATP. And again, once we form this 12 carbon acyl CoA, it can go through another round of beta oxidation to create more reduced cofactors, and then another round and another round until we're left with a bunch of acetyl CoA products. And once we form these acetyl CoA products, they can either enter the Krebs cycle. However, usually in the context of beta oxidation, these acetyl CoA molecules enter ketogenesis to biosynthesize ketone bodies and keto acids. However, you may wonder when uh, is our body doing beta oxidation? Where is our body doing beta oxidation? And why is our body doing beta oxidation? What is the context in which our body and our cells do beta oxidation? So what's important to realize is it's extremely important to make sure there's enough glucose in the bloodstream. Why is it so important to make sure there's glucose in the blood? Because the brain requires glucose as a source of energy and the brain gets its glucose from the blood. So it's important to make sure there's glucose in the blood to keep the brain happy. However, what happens if you don't eat for a couple of days? Well, if you don't eat for a couple of days, your blood glucose levels are gonna drop. You're gonna have low levels of glucose in the blood. So that's a problem because now the brain doesn't have a source of glucose. However, what happens is the pancreas senses that there's low glucose in the blood. So in response, the pancreas releases glucagon. And essentially this glucagon tells the body, hey, we have low blood glucose. We need to restore blood glucose concentrations to keep the brain happy. So how do we do that? Well, essentially what happens is that glucagon tells the liver to biosynthesize new glucose molecules to go through this process referred to as gluconeogenesis. So this glucagon tells the liver to go through gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize new glucose molecules. Now the liver can dump glucose molecules into the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. And now the brain has a source of glucose. However, what's important to realize is in order to do gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize glucose molecules, we need a source of carbons. Because again, glucose is a six carbon carbohydrate. So if the liver wants to biosynthesize glucose molecules, we need a source of carbons. So the primary sources of carbons are amino acids, glycerol, and lactate. However, what's also important to realize is this is an anabolic process. If we want to biosynthesize new glucose molecules, we need ATP because this is anabolism. To build molecules, that requires energy and that requires ATP, so we need a source of ATP. So where do we get the ATP to biosynthesize glucose molecules? Well, What's important to realize is we have these triacylglycerides, these triglyceride molecules in our fat, in our adipocytes. So what we can do is we can take these triglycerides and we can hydrolyze these ester linkages. And when we hydrolyze these ester linkages, we release free fatty acids and glycerol. So again, remember glycerol has carbons that can be donated to biosynthesize glucose molecules. So that's where the glycerol comes from, and that's what happened to the glycerol molecules. But what happened to these free fatty acids that are released when we break these ester linkages releasing these free fatty acids? What do we do with these free fatty acids? Well, they enter the blood, and they enter into the liver. And now that they enter into a hepatocyte in the liver, we can take those free fatty acids, and we can go through rounds of beta oxidation. And we know every time we do one round of beta oxidation, we create these reduced cofactors. So again, we do a bunch of rounds of beta oxidation and every time we do rounds of beta oxidation, we produce more and more reduced cofactors. So now we're producing a bunch of these reduced cofactors, which we know can fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. And that's where the ATP comes from that's used for gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize these glucose molecules to keep the brain happy. So essentially, this is what happens when our body enters a fasted state. If you don't eat for a couple days, 
you're gonna have low glucose in the blood. So in response, the pancreas is gonna sense that low glucose and it's gonna release glucagon. And that glucagon is gonna choreograph and orchestrate these metabolic processes all geared towards biosynthesizing new glucose molecules that can be released into the bloodstream to restore blood glucose concentrations to keep the brain happy. So again, the key idea is we burn fat in order to create the ATP necessary to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And that's the context in which our bodies do beta oxidation, in which our cells do beta oxidation. So again, it's mostly the liver doing beta oxidation to create the energy to biosynthesize glucose to keep the brain happy.